So the good news is that Sputnik V is now proven to be 91.6% effective against symptomatic COVID-19. Um, and what's even better is that it's proven to be 100% effective against severe illness and death, which is awesome because we're not worried about, you know, people getting, you know, a cough or some, you know, bad flu symptoms. What we're worried about are, you know, hospital systems getting overrun and people dying. And if you take Sputnik V, that will definitely not happen. So that's great. Um, particularly when you consider that 2 million people have already had the Sputnik V vaccine, um, those people can now rest easy knowing that they are in fact protected. Um, the phase three trials tested the vaccine on about 20,000 people, about a quarter of whom had comorbidities. So basically what we've learned from that is that Sputnik V is the same caliber vaccine as the other big name guys, Pfizer, Moderna. So this is another really strong weapon in our sort of anti-COVID-19 arsenal. Not anymore. Um, because of the haste which with, with which the vaccine was developed and the sort of political pressure that drove its development and its approval. I think that lots of people were correct to raise an eyebrow. Um, they definitely took an unconventional approach. Usually when you conduct clinical trials, you know, phase one, you try it out on a small number of people and you make sure that everything checks out, that it's not harmful. And then in phase two, you gradually, you know, bump that up to a larger number of people. Um, and then when you feel confident that it is, um, you know, that it's not harmful, that it provokes immune response, that's when you go to phase three trials and you test it against a placebo. So at the time when, you know, Russia approved Sputnik V for emergency use in August, they knew that it provoked an immune response, but they had only tested it out on a small number of people, double digits and they had no clue if it protected against COVID. They didn't know. Um, so it was a, definitely a big gamble and not a gamble that other countries were really willing to take. Um, they were also pretty hedgy, um, not very transparent about their data. So Kirill Dmitriev, who's in charge of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, which is the organization that you know, funded and pushed the Sputnik V development, promised over and over again to publish the results of their trials, their data in a credited peer reviewed scientific journal and they promised and promised and it, it took them a long time to do that. Um, but now that the Lancet you know, has published these results, um, we know that everything is above board, that this is a, a solid vaccine. So all of those doubts should be put to rest. So lots of countries are using Sputnik V. Um, primarily, you know, Russia's chosen allies, BRICS countries, some low and middle income countries. Um, and so this is a really good opportunity for Russia to shore up relations with a lot of those countries that it wants to be better friends with. They've been very aggressive in their marketing. Sputnik V has a lot of advantages that make it appealing to those lower middle income countries, it doesn't need to be refrigerated at those super low temperatures that some other vaccines do. Um, so it can be a really good option for vaccinating the world. Um, not everyone is on board, however. Ukraine has banned Sputnik V for use, um, although rumors circulate that Russia is supplying it to the occupied territories of Donbass and Lugansk in Eastern Ukraine. Um, the Russian Direct Investment Fund denies this, um, but Ukraine's reticence to use Sputnik V, or just actually not reticence, but refusal to use Sputnik V is understandable given the, you know, the massive vaccine disinformation campaign that Russia has been waging in Eastern Europe. Um, they have been accused of spreading malign disinformation, mainly about Western vaccines, that they have terrible side effects, that they're dangerous and unproven, experimental, um, promoting anti-vaxxer conspiracy theories, um, many of which have permeated the US. 
um, Kirill Dmitriev, you know, the, the man in charge, is quoted as saying that Western vaccine manufacturers rely on experimental, little studied, and unproven in the long term technologies, which is absolutely false. Um, in fact, Sputnik V and other, you know, reputable Western vaccines are actually very similar. Um, basically, all this goes to show is that Russia's priorities appear to be, you know, reaping the geopolitical benefits of this vaccine first and fighting coronavirus second. Um, that being said, you know, Ukraine's decision is understandable, but not necessarily wise, you know, given how hard hit they are with the virus. One thing to keep in mind is that vaccine diplomacy is rapidly becoming a new front for global power competition, great power competition. Uh, and Russia and China are really making strides to vaccinate the world to make sure that people are taking their vaccines. Um, and, you know, that's really something to think about um, when you consider that, you know, the EU has banned exports of vaccines. Um, lots of Western countries have been accused of vaccine hoarding. Um, that endeavor, and Russia is not giving Sputnik V away for free. They're not donating it. Um, the countries definitely have to pay for it. But, you know, when the pandemic is said and done, I think people will remember whose vaccine they had. Um, so now that Biden has made the decision to re-enter the World Health Organization, I think that's really something to consider. Does the US, does Europe want to jump on that vaccination bandwagon, vaccinate, you know, other countries? Um, or are they going to let all of those geopolitical benefits go to Russia and China. Russia didn't develop their vaccine faster. They just approved it earlier. Um, that there were other vaccines in the pipeline that were further along in their trials than Sputnik V, but Russia, you know, made the executive decision that they were going to be the first, they were going to start vaccinating people right away, they weren't going to waste any time, which was a big gamble that has happened to pay off really well. Um, that same strategy, you know, just as a cautionary tale, did not work out so well for Russia in other contexts, for example, um, Earlier in the pandemic, Raspatrebnadzor, um, which is like a consumer watchdog biological sanitation agency in Russia, they are in charge of giving biological labs permission to use, you know, live disease samples, um, the biological material that you need to to study COVID nineteen, and they made a decision to divert all of those samples, all the COVID swabs, all the COVID tests, to one lab. Um, they had a sort of pet project in Novosibirsk. They wanted to speed up the, you know, the creation of a COVID test um, and they monopolized all the research and that um, actually backfired on them and they ended up delaying mass testing in Russia um, and also damaging the prospects of a lot of other good COVID research that was happening in other parts of Russia. So that political pressure to, you know, to be fast, to be the first, doesn't always pay off, but uh, in this case it did and the world is better for it. <laughs>